Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of uh, Savvy Seeks. It's uh, nine o'clock or close to that time uh, when we talk about current affairs. I'm your host, Dr. Savvy, and I've got uh, with me what we describe ourselves as, or myself, you guys, as uh, Seek Youth. And I really wanted to cover this topic in the consideration of the fact that coming up to, I guess, in about another week or so's time, it will be 27 years since the tragic events of 84. The fact that those pogroms took place, and I strongly recommend that you look up the word pogrom, because it is very different to the word riot. Pogrom is about when one society or one community hits another society or another part of the community for no reason, and actually the result at the end of the day was a genocide. The genocide is really, I guess you could uh, put it to a holocaust. And you know, after 27 years, and then two years ago there was a 25th anniversary march uh, all the way in central London, and every summer in June uh, I go on that march uh, in a hope uh, for justice. A couple of years ago I did actually do a documentary, and you can look it up on the YouTube channel as well for myself, which is uh, youtube.com forward slash dot a and it's called Justice and Hope. Um, the two words I think kind of go together, justice in the context, the fact that we haven't actually had any, and hope in the context that we hope to get justice, but we hope the issue is actually resolved in the context of that apology, the fact that we um, capture those people who actually cause those atrocities to happen. Uh, we have hope for the people that are left behind, the orphans, the widows, and also people in the northern part of Punjab as well. And you know what, there's a ripple effect as well, because those who were there at that time uh, whether they lost their children or their children are there or there are issues associated with uh, people living in those villages who are left with uh, in a poverty situation. Um, you know, there's a hope that we can recognise that we need to help them. You know, and I've actually got some great people here today to talk about those issues. Um, but really, when you, when you call in later on, we are going to take calls in about 20 minutes' time, I want you to consider it from just the context of this issue is still alive today. And is it still alive today with our youth? Um, is there a solution that we can offer in terms of saying, look, you know, the question to ask is, what would you do if you were a member of the Indian government? Would you stand up there and admit that you really did wrong uh, at that time? Would you recommend uh, some funds for orphanages? Would you help some of the widows? Is there no guilt in your minds about the fact that ultimately you have a responsibility for what was left behind. And today, people still suffer. So that's really the context of the programme. It's 1984 from the context of justice and hope, and also considering what the youth think of it today. And I want to ask just a general question to my uh, esteemed guests here today. Uh, I will get them to introduce themselves very quickly. And I want to ask them, you know, they watched that programme that the BBC did recently, called um, 1984, A Sikh Story, I think that's what it was called. I had a few critical aspects of that, and I, I wrote that on my blog, about the fact that it didn't really hit home at the central issue of what was going on, the water situation, the fact that it had been going on post-1947. A lot of people don't recognise the history behind this particular issue. And I really think that when we see youth today, even those that were there at the time, myself, I was a young chap then, uh, and those who weren't born, I think none of you guys were born at that time, um, is the story being rewritten? Is, and the word story, it's not a story, it's a fact. The fact is that we do not have justice, and we need to continue to fight for it. And those who were there at the time, and those that are the children now today's youth, need to recognise that we've got to keep this on. The Jews keep it on. They do not forget about the Holocaust, and nor should we as well. So really, I'll get everyone to introduce themselves, and please answer that question. Did you get a chance to watch that program done by the BBC? Yeah. And what were yeah. your views as well? So from the left-hand side, who are you going to go first? Um, yeah, my name's Indabar Singh. What do you do? I uh, work in PwC, so price for housekeepers in uh, banking and capital markets finance. Okay, very good. A very interesting job. Yeah, well, yeah, time to time. It depends when it's busy and it's not. Yeah, thank you for coming after work as well. No I problem. appreciate That's your fine. time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, tell us your name, brother. Uh, my name is Shamshir Singh. I'm from Southall. Okay. I've lived here my whole life. Yeah. And you do uh, IT stuff as well, don't you? Yeah. And a whole variety um, of things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know these things. <laughs> okay. And? I'm Gurjit Singh. I'm a civil servant at Okay. Very good. And you do some work for Castle Aid as well, don't you? 
Find it one. You can watch them cross it over, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, answer to a question if you guys have got a view. Do you watch that programme? What do you think of that programme then, what BBC? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, yeah, I did watch it. And to be honest, before that, I had, I had a knowledge about 1984, not kind of in depth, like, you know, the political movement behind it, not so much about Bindar Awali, only obviously about the attack. You know, you go to the Golden Temple as a kid and you see the pictures and stuff, and you start asking your mum and dad, oh, do you yes, know what happened at the time? And, it's only when you kind of get older that you start to realise, well, you know, there was actually a lot of big, big story behind it. It doesn't just happen in 1984. There's, you know, 78 was it was in the Bengali movement and before that and probably since the partition of India, really. So, yeah, um, I think in a way it's good that the programme happened so that even we can be critical about it and say it didn't really, you know, look at every single aspect. But for the majority of people there, they learnt something from the programme, so especially the bit, you know, when you saw the, um, the widows in Delhi. Anyone who watched that definitely would have got emotional kind of watching that, you know, mm -hmm. think, you know, how can this kind of happen? Was it 26 years? I think maybe? in that particular programme, they had a, a girl who was being interviewed, and uh, she, uh, a lady, I should say, was being interviewed, and I think she was under a bit of pressure as well, wasn't she? From somebody yeah, then she broke down in tears and stuff. Yeah, and I think there was a situation where a particular politician had been named and um, mm -hmm. was causing some kind of, um, I guess, behind the scenes uh, trouble for her as well about not appearing the witness. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, even after 27 years, they know they did wrong, and they know they're trying to get to them, you know, mm. which I think is quite interesting. You know, um, so what about um, Shinfi? I think what do you think of that program? Um, I thought, you know, um, it didn't really do justice to the subject at all. Um, I thought the presenter was inappropriate. I thought the whole the way the program was done was inappropriate. Okay. Um, it's, it's such a, um, a deep issue, um, and it's rooted in so much history. Um, do you think it brought out pain? Um, I think, yeah, it did bring out the pain, an element of the pain, but I mean, you can't even begin to describe the levels of atrocities that were suffered upon the Sikh community um, by those that are in power. And that one fact I don't think was made clear enough by that program. It wasn't made clear that the people that were perpetrating, committing these acts, are the same people that are in power in the Indian state mm -hmm. today, this day, this day and age. While they were there, you know, laughing around and going about in India, they didn't highlight that fact that it's the same people, it's the same pol politicians. It's in fact, the people that were holding lower positions at that time are holding higher positions now. They've, they've um, tightened their grip on power and authority. They haven't loosened it. Um, Sikhs can never get justice in an environment like that, especially a mainstream organization like the BBC isn't willing to really show the reality of the issue, and they never will because this country has billions of dollars worth of trade relations you know, with India. And with do, you think, do you not think it's an irony of the fact that at the time there was a Congress government that was in charge, and now the Congress government is in charge, and now you've got a Sikh uh, gentleman who's leading it? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know whether you can call uh, him a Sikh. I don't know. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very deep issue. I mean, on one hand, you've had people that gave up their, whole, their lives their family lives, their children have suffered, you know, their wives, their daughters have suffered. Um, you know, it's not just the people that have lost their lives fighting against the atrocities, it's the, the absolute barbarity um, on, that their families are faced with and by the police forces and by the security forces. Um, I don't think it, for a second it really showed the depth and the reality of the issue and how the, the struggle, it wasn't just, you know, Sikhs picking up arms and fighting against the government because we didn't like them, mm -hmm. because they were Hindu and we were Sikh. It, the very fabric of our beings as Sikhs, our history, our ideas, who we are, what we represent, our, our religious views, if you want to call Sikhi a religion, our way of life, what we stand for, it's ingrained in our culture, it's ingrained, mm -hmm. you know, in that um, revolution. And you know, terrible thing like that, you know, from the Sikhs throughout the ages, throughout the years, We've actually defended other religions. We've actually given our lives up for the freedom of others yes. to practice their religion. Mm -hmm. you know? Not just uh, in not just in India, in the world wars as well, the first and second world war. I mean, we the Sikhs have fought in every theatre of war. You know, I mean, we all know about Sahib Rai when twenty one Sikhs stood against more than ten thousand Afghans. You know that we've co constantly fought, and it's for those values: freedom, liberty, equality. You know those values that we hold dear to our hearts. And we fought and we put our lives on the lines. And 1984 wasn't just, you know, I mean, Abhijit Singh will explain, in, uh, he's got a lot of knowledge in the subject, but the, the levels of atrocity and the, I mean, the absolute injustice that was being inflicted, not just on the Sikhs, but on the state, you know, with Indira Gandhi, who was convicted of electoral fraud, and rather than release her grip on power, she declared a state of emergency. Yeah, that was the case, yeah. And the Sikhs, in their thousands, their tens of thousands, marched against her. And they said that, you know, they suspended the right to life, they mm. suspended the right to liberty, 
you know, this is the government, and it, it was it was a lot deeper than just you know an attack and a militant yeah. seek. And yeah, as I said before, they had been going on for a long time since 1947, yeah. when the before then. was made for greater autonomy of that state, yeah. the land, water right issue, the land right issue. Yeah. I think that's one of the grievances I had with the program <coughs> personally was. Um, producing. Pudgy. Pudgy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Interrupt you in flow. Producing. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you've done a lot of research in, that, in this area. I'm quite keen on this. I, I think that, first and foremost, you know, we all must, do as much as we can, to read about the subject. I think yeah. it's a very important part of our history. And um, I think uh, the passing mentioned as well that it's, it wasn't just 84. Mm -hmm. People are fixated with this year. I think that image and that concept is. Um, advocate for a reason so that we don't look before 84 to mm. think what led up to that. Mm. Mm. Um, my view to the program is that it didn't do justice and I think there's certain issues, for example like apartheid, that you couldn't do in a half an hour show, a 45 minute show. Right, sure. And I feel that it's better to have not done it rather than have done it that way. Mm. Do you think they're trying to like make, like it, make it into a story and go here, so define beginning, middle, and end? It was like a whitewash, mm, really. Yeah. And it had like a little happy ending and end in fireworks. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you speak to the widows in Dindi, I'm sure that's not how they live their lives. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's the biggest problem I had with that. I mean, first of all, they didn't mention the non our resolution in that program. Right. Yeah. They, made it they, they, they kept they talking about Khalistan. It's got nothing. The, the, the movement had nothing to do with Khalistan. No. It's all about the resolution. What was it? You know. Then water. But the thing is, there was a few things. I think there was in the non side resolution there was one or two issues in there which were related to Sikhs, mm -hmm. but everything else was for Punjabis, mm -hmm. and the support that okay. the Dharmid Morti had um, at that time was pushing for greater rights for Punjabis, mm -hmm. for water, for electricity. I mean, the waters of Punjab have been diverted to different states. The energy that's generated from those rivers are enjoyed by other states, yet when, when they burst their banks when there's flooding, the Java has to pick up the bill for that. Right. And these are against riparian laws. Um, a case had been taken to the Supreme Court, um, and but th these things were brought in to try and disabilize that, which, and that's what happened. Okay. And in regards to what you, what you guys mentioned about Manmohan Singh, um, it's important to note that Gandhi Zell Singh was the president of India yeah, at the time. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, never, I mean, so it didn't really make a lot of difference. And that's another thing that really, have no power, you know. and that's the thing that really upset me about that program as well, because they portioned the blame of what happened in Delhi onto the Sikhs in Punjab. Mm. And that was completely irrelevant. Mm, yeah. It's the same way of that after 25 years, they get a Sikh to, to, to apologize to the Sikhs. Yeah. You know, by Manmohan Singh apologizing after 25 years on behalf of the government, it's, you know, it's, it's a mockery. Yeah. You see, uh, the, um, the thing with programs like that is that they're very. Sometimes I feel, although you know you've got researchers there, it's skimmed. You know, uh, and there's a program by Michael Woods called The History of India, right? And I have written as well to the producers and said to them, "This is a BBC program," and said, "You did this entire TV series on the Mughals. And you didn't mention Guru Gobind Singh once. Mm. You didn't mention all our gurus. You didn't mention the Sikhs. What's wrong with you people?" And then you know the reply that I got back from the researcher was. Uh, unfortunately in a program series, and it was actually not just one episode, there was a number of episodes, in a program like this, um, sometimes we have to go through the research very quickly mm -hmm. and, and actually pull out the, the, the areas that, you know, this, basically in other words I was saying they were skimming through the history and just placing stuff that they liked. Uh, I, think it goes, I think it goes deeper than incompetence because I think, it's it, research, I think it's more than that. I think it has to be, you know, it's, it was the BBC and um, an example I'll give you of that is that Amila Bachchan seeks for justice and all the NGO in, in the States are pursuing legal action against Amila Bachchan. In Australia. In Australia. Absolutely. Yet the BBC, um, they had an article today about Amila Bachchan about him getting an honorary doctor, doctorate in Australia. And they failed to mention in that whole article and oh by the way, schools that have served mm. and they're pursuing legal action against him for inciting hatred and, and, and mobs to kill tens of thousands of people. Right. So, Again, was that just an issue that, oh, they just slipped their mind? Well, you know, I remember, I think um, it's different than that. even after 84, in terms of the, you know, uh, petrol canisters were similar. They were f sourced from the same place. Electoral lists were available. Mm. Uh, they were floating around between uh, different parts of uh, Delhi and saying, mm. well, see that over there, that's where the Sikhs actually lived, and uh, directing the mobs into that area. This is an orchestrated set of violence for three days. Right, to fight, one, think, to kill one community, basically. Mm. I think it was great what you said earlier about, about the pogroms and the definition of that. I think it's very important. I think uh, the two biggest uh, things that we need to consider when, they, when we talk about the Dili riots was firstly that 
it was not contained in only Delhi. In fact, the, it was most of the northern, northern, uh, Other places northern India as well. And yeah. the list I've got over here is that Sikhs were killed in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, nearly 40 towns in Madhya Pradesh, Haryana, West Bengal, Himachal Pradesh, Assam, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, and Gujarat. One of the only areas that weren't really affected was Punjab. Right. But we call it Delhi riots, and straight away you can find that to Delhi. Mm -hmm. yeah. Secondly, riot yeah. means two way though, unfortunately. Sure. It's not a riot. That's the thing. The thing. second thing is riots. Yeah. Um, Genocide is defined by the United Nations as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, or racial or religious group, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group such conditions to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Now we've had, I was going to talk more about the LA riots in some of my writings I have, but now we've had the riots in London. Yeah. Mm. And you can see that's what a riot was, you know, it was chaos. But uh, in, the, in the LA riots, I think it went on for six days and 53 people died. Mm. And that was because um, the Korean truck people were firing back at the riot and stuff. Right. And, right. But in, the, in what happened in Delhi, you know, we got close to between, if you look at the official estimate, which is about 4,000, and independent human rights organizations, they get to about 10,000. Yeah, and the numbers are big. For three days, the best thing that wasn't a riot. It was definitely state sponsored, orchestrated. You know, for three involved. days there was no, and there was nothing on the street. There were no police people mm -hmm. on the street. They were. I mean, in, in some cases they, they were, were attacking. Yeah. They were okay. they were attacking seats mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think this is a general question? And you go to places in Delhi where you see the widow colony. Okay. Do you think the fact that hidden poverty, and I'll talk also about Punjab as well, and I'll talk. Uh, we'll, we'll mention uh, in a minute. We'll, we'll cover Delhi first. Um, if there is no view, if there's no public um, uh, perception that there still is an issue there, it's hidden from view, right? So that means that the, the, there is no problem. And is that what you think the, the picture is today? The fact that nobody knows about those widows, that nobody knows about the orphans, nobody knows about the farmers who have lost their kids, and maybe uh, a family may have lost a whole load of, uh, of people who lived in, uh, in mm. that, uh, as a group together in that community. What do we do? I mean, you're the youth. You know, what, what, how do we publicise this when we don't even have media to talk about it? You know, is it convenient that it's out of view? I don't think it's. I think maybe that does uh, increase the problem, but I don't think it's simply because of poverty. Uh, in India, you've got a situation where books have been banned, films have been banned because they've stated in those films that um, that, that there were political um, actors who, who were involved, and because of those, uh, it's a line like that. I think I'm. A, the film Amu was banned. I mean, it, was, it was banned. It was, banned. it was an interesting film because it was subtle. You know? Exactly. Yeah. There's a film called Hawaii and stuff, and, and mm. even that film was banned. It was, so it's not just because these are in, in areas of poverty. And I must stress as well that these are areas of poverty now, after the destruction. They weren't all areas of poverty before. Right. The Sikhs were thriving businessmen in these areas and stuff, but they lost livelihoods. Right. Um, but it's not because of poverty. I think that might. You know, increase the, the issue because when we go back to Delhi or we go to Punjab, you might not see those areas. Mm -hmm. But the real reason is because um, it's an effort but on, the, on the state um, to try and, and hide this, to mm. sweep this under the blanket. Okay, so and when you, you went to Punjab, tell us the story that you went to Punjab, didn't you? Yeah, so. Um, when, when did you go and what did you see? Uh, so, yeah, so recently, I mean, it was just, I started off, I just went to Gurdwara one day in Nottingham and I wasn't even going to go that day, and we walked in and I saw Ravi Singh from Khan Said, and my mum was there, and she said, oh, the fight was Khan Said, see so I was like, okay, we'll go talk to him, and, you know, I started talking to him, and I, I said, yeah, you know, I, have a, I, I, I give a direct debit every month, and, you know, like, well, you know, you support the charity, and then I kind of, I kind of picked a little fight, I was like, I did actually volunteer to do some, you know, some work when I was, before I joined, you know, started working, it's like three months of my holiday, but no one ever got back to me, and he goes, oh, you know, we're very busy, it's quite a small organisation. And he goes, um, well, would you like to ever do it? And I was like, well, actually, I'm going to India next week, so it's going to be a while before you know, I come back. And he goes, oh, you're going to India? And um, he goes, why don't you go there? We can set you up. Somebody come pick you up. Um, you can get to Ljubljana, get to Amrita, I'll give you the number. They'll pick you up. They'll take you around the Shahid Barwaz for a day so you can see kind of the kind of poverty they live in. These, these are families that have lost their sons, you know, livelihoods, if you like. <clears throat> and, you know, you can go there, visit them, understand their story. And also, you know, you can give donations, etc., and just spread the word, really. And so, you know, obviously, I went there. Harkir is in Khalsa. He's um, he's one of the one of the guys in Punjab. Picked me up, and we just, you know, slowly we went to Amritsar. I went to so you go to Amritsar, Sahib, the Darbar Sahib, and it's probably about an hour away from that. So you don't even know how big the the state of Amritsar is. Really, really big, and um, the district, sorry. 
So we got there and we started slowly going around everyone's house and, you know, you started off, and these are the poorest of the poorest people. You walk in, and Bajadi, she, she didn't, I mean, there's one lady, she didn't even know kind of what was going on. She sat down and was like, can you just bring, you know, a picture out of the sun that was straight away, so the picture started crying. It just brings back these emotions. And, and you're watching this, with, and for me, the thing that I, I always want to stress is that we, we see up in this country. So, you know, for example, let's say you're in a city, you walk in, you see Sadari Najah, you acknowledge someone, you feel like... I used to work the same in the department of health, we used to say, what is it with you guys in the seat and nod? You know, you walk yeah. and see each other. Sometimes people do it. Well, you get blank sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Unless, <laughs> you get blank sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Unless... 95% of people do do the seat nod. They do do it. Yeah. But that, again, what does that relate to? It's a sense of pride. You see you in person, you know, you say, oh, he's, he's one of us, you know, and I like, say hello. And the thing is, everyone in this country is relatively, you know, they're doing well for themselves, they're comfortable, they're well off, they're living a good life. And when you go to Punjab and you see that kind of poverty, it's a bit of a shock. It hits your system. Like, you know, this, this, she, she, I mean, she reminded me of my grandma. Because I unfortunately asked my grandma about four or five years ago. And you see her, and you straight away think about my grandma, and it's like, you know, how can this have happened to someone that, you know, so closely kind of linked, if you like? And um, yes, yeah, so going back to what you said, we went to another family. And there's one woman, and we'll just, so I'll tell you about a story. She had three sons. Um, the eldest son is a halwai, so you know they make delivery on all that for weddings or parties and stuff like that. And that's very temperamental. Like you know, sometimes you have a job, sometimes you don't. The middle son was the one who was assassinated in 1990. And um, you know, when, when we asked it, okay, did anyone come and help you? They like, oh, mm-hmm. and we're like, okay, well, did anyone give you the body? They're like, no. Like, how no did one gave you? the body. No one gave the body back. Okay. Like, how did you find out about it? And she like, you know, no one. We just heard from the streets, people yelling, for the we didn't know what happened to him, never saw him again. And unfortunately after that, the youngest son went mental, as in, you know, really just affect him. And that, so imagine I'm going to this house, the eldest son's out working, there's ten people living in this house that's supported by one person. The youngest son, who's now, what, 38, he's got a daddy, he was a bug, and he's, he's got the mental ability of probably about a six-year-old. So we're trying to interview this lady, and he's behind her pulling faces and goes, Emily Maya, and all this stuff. And she actually slaps him across the face. Okay. As in, just to, I mean, to see a grown man, that happens. So she hasn't just lost one son, she's lost two sons. And what's happened. And you know, a, a family, and things like the youngest son's married and he's got children. So what type of future is this kid to now? Absolute poverty. I'm talking about the bricks are falling off the walls, Gandhi Kapre. They had one much. Which, you know, I mean, nowadays, that mud dies, the cost of a mud apparently is about 30,000, 40,000 rupees, which is a lot of money. Right. So, yeah. so, what you don't see, you don't know about? I mean, what? I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, you people talk about 84. About I went to the march in 1984, went there, shouted some Jagada, you know, talked about Khalistan. And you don't really know what's behind that. You don't really see the poverty. And, I mean, it was, look, it didn't take a lot of effort for me. And, I mean, I went because, you know, to do some wedding shopping. and. Literally, all I had to do was spare a day. Somebody picked me up, took me there, and it certainly affected me, and it will affect me for the rest of my life. And obviously, that's something that I'm going to share now to all of my friends. If that affects another 100 people, and it's, it's a ripple effect. Let's talk about that ripple effect, right? So the ripple effect affected people that were there at the time, mm-hmm. meaning the people that suffered. The people that saw it from a distance, like us living in London, or living in Canada, or living wherever in the United States. And we were limited in what we could do because it was a news blackout at the time. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, when we look at the, fu- the future generation, you are the future generation in the context you were not born at that period, mm-hmm. right? So 27 years have gone by. You mentioned, uh, I interrupted you when earlier when I was saying, how you get all this information? You've read loads of books, haven't you? So, but do you think the books that are there today are truly reflective of what actually happened, or is there something being rewritten there? You have to be very careful because um, some of the most um, popular books on the subject, or the best-selling books on the subject, are written by some of the people who actually are responsible for the violence, like KP Skill, notorious police officer. Mm. He's written a book, and his book is best-selling. And Isn't there a book also available? I know I've seen a copy of it, which lists the individuals that were responsible and where they came from. There's a, there was a report um, by the People's Union for Civil Liberties, the Indian Human Rights Group, who went door to door after the, the genocide happened in Delhi, and they compiled a list. I think over 200 people. Yeah, I've seen it. And that's the, they're the ones who do that, yeah. Okay. And to, to today, even though they have got mm. testimonies and everything, fresh from the next day, um, none of those people, apart from two, have ever been punished. So you think, right, over 27 years of your lives, so and not all of you are 27, some of you are younger than that, um, why do you think, in your opinion, 
the justice process is so slow. What is it? We will find out what you found out about by reading, because you weren't there, and hearing stories, and actually, in your case, mm -hmm. in your case, you've seen and been in those places as well, whether you've done charity work or whatever. Mm -hmm. what, what is the, I mean, from Shirty, what, what do you think? Is your, what's your view? Why does it take I so think, long? Um, I, think you know? I mean, I know feel it was a Jewish easy. situation. Did that take a long time? Well, they still remember it. They still make films about it, but, you know. For the Jewish people, it did take a long time as well. I think what the, the key, the point that we have to kind of realize, and I'll stress it again and again, the reason that this stuff is going to take long and it will take it will take forever is because the people that were responsible for these atrocities are still in power today, mm. um, and that's that's the reality of the situation. So, so you're saying that maybe that the politicians are above the law or are the law? The, it's the, it's the, the machinery of the state in a way is against the Sikhs. In a way, it's an undeclared war on the Sikh nation, and that's been going on since partition. You know, and um, they they're attacking us. You know, from from brutally in the streets, you know, kidnapping youngsters. I mean, this. I mean, some of the stuff you re read about, you think, how can this have happened? You know, in a nation that professes to be the world's largest democracy, they went out in broad daylight, went to villages, kidnapped the youth, assassinated um, young men, raped um, and tortured the women. You know, they killed old people. They didn't spare anyone. I mean, they went in villages that are still, till this day, feeling the effects of those police officers. There's notorious police officers everyone knows about, Gobind Ram, who used to go around in villages and drag everybody out of the pen mm. and, you know, and, and, and afflict. Is there a famous book? Do you know about that book which is kind of called in, uh, in Faith and Nation? I think it's called. Fighting for Faith and Nation. Yeah, and, yeah. and, yeah. Yeah. and that's it. There's an article in there, isn't it? There's yeah. a piece in there. I think it's on. Gobind Ram's uh, operation, that one of his operations he uh, sponsored, um, that he led as a police officer, was Operation Shodikaran, which was um, the rape of Sikh women, where he would go out with his police officers and rape Sikh women. Why and is there such hatred against Sikh? What's the deal here, man? The deal is because when when you're in power and it's for your, it, it, it's a simple thing. I, when you think about it, it's shockingly, you know, the reality is it's about money and it's about power. And that's it. It always has been and it always will be since the beginning of time. It's about money and it's about power. The people that are in power have money. They don't want to get rid of that power. They don't want to relinquish that power. Mm -hmm. And the people like the Sikhs, whose very nature it is, whose religion, whose dharam it is, to fight against oppression and fight against injustice. And fight for other people. And fight, fight for against the defenseless. Fight, fight, yeah, fight for the defenseless. You know, it, it's, it's part of our religion. It's part of our way of life. We will always be a thorn in the side of those oppressors, like Indra Gandhi, who, when she was convicted of electoral fraud, um, declared a state of emergency to hold her power. And she realized that the one minority, the one group that's going to cause her a problem is the Sikhs. Which did. Which did. They did. There were, there were, there were, up to 60,000 Sikhs were protesting, and they carried on protesting under, mm -hmm. under yeah. obviously, all the lucky charges and all that going to prison until they overthrew the emergency. The British, the British Empire had, um, uh, they had a Raj over India and, and a lot of the world. And it, and it was for their Raj and for their trade. I mean, if you kick the ballistics, mm -hmm. it was for spices and it was for oils and it was for gems. Yeah. yeah, it was for it was for material wealth that they oppressed an entire nation. Uh, you know, and they inflicted atrocities and you know brutally oppressed the people. And for what? For material wealth? For spices? For trade? For money? For gold? You know, and that's the reality. The people in power now, the reason why the justice is going to be a long time in coming is because as soon as a Sikh gets to a stage where, you know, he could do something, they either buy him out or they character assassinate him or they just kill him simply. Mm -hmm. But there's so many ways to remove people these okay, days. Okay, so what about in the world, in 1984, there wasn't any internet. Well, there was internet in the, in the universities, but there wasn't anything commercially available as the internet. Now we've got loads of websites. Now we've got channels like Sikh Channel and other channels where we have an opportunity to communicate. Yeah, we're now we've got informed. films. So we're we're are we still informed. limited in the fact we're that we can't? We're much less informed. The Sikhs at that time in 1984 and the times before that were more informed, politically aware, they were more philosophically aware, they were more in tune of, with their own, with their tharam, with their Sikh way of life, and they were, they were politically aware of what's happening in other nations. You know, when they were interviewed and they were asked in 84, freedom fighters were asked, what will you do, you know, after you're successful here, or, you know, after this is resolved? They said, you know, there's, in Bosnia, Bosnia, there's oppression there, and in other nations, there's the same situation, and we would like to help these people, and we'd like to help other people where there's, you know, oppression. The Sikhs have always been, you know, very well, I mean, if you read the way the Sikhs lived and the way they thought, they were much, much more advanced mm -hmm. in, our, in our past than, than we are now. We, yet we have books, we don't read them. We have internet, we spend all day on Facebook. We have mm -hmm. TV, we watch crap. 
You know, we, we have so much knowledge, we have so much at our disposal, yet we don't do anything with it. I was going to stop you there because I think what we, one of the things that we wanted to do, and I, I mentioned it right at the beginning of the program, uh, was to take calls, right? So um, I'm going to plug myself in. So if you want to call in now, we've got studio phones working, uh, you can take part in the program. Uh, create a hashtag on Twitter if you want to discuss it between yourself as well called uh, hashtag uh, never forget 84. Um, so go ahead and do that. And the uh, great thing about the internet is that, you know, if we continue with that hashtag and it will stay alive within Twitter and you can continue to find out more information and uh, tweet away. Uh, on Facebook you can go as well and if you want to mention things, I think it was a discussion that was started on the Seat Channel uh, Facebook page as well. So, hey, all this technology that exists, right? And ultimately, do we have an opportunity to um, put the pressure on electronically? Write petitions, uh, write letters, do mm. those things that can effectively... I don't think uh, that any, any that stuff's not going to get you anywhere, really. I mean, if, you, if the reality of the situation is that e-petitions and, you know, Facebook campaigns, yeah, yeah, will create awareness, you know, a few more people might get informed. But in reality, in changing the situation, in really changing the reality for Sikhs in India and in the rest of the world, right. it's going to happen on the ground. You need feet on the ground, you know, battles and wars aren't won, you know, like that. You know, we don't have an intelligentsia, we don't, you know, we don't have a, a, that level, we're not developed as a nation to that level, you know, we, we have 50,000 rival Sikh organizations that compete with publicity amongst mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. you know, we've got two Sikh channels and they're constantly competing with Well, each other there is competition that, it, that exists, but sometimes that competition can be good because it can yield good opportunities and innovations, Depends and sometimes involved, the innovation yeah. is bad because competition is bad because ultimately we all got to be singing from the same story, which mm -hmm. is the fact that mm -hmm. we want that justice. So let's check out if there's any calls coming through and see if there are. Okay. Okay, calls coming through now. Thank you a lot for uh, calling in. I really appreciate it. Please uh, tell us what your name is and your viewpoint. Indeljit Singh, Sikh Aid International. Nice to hear from you. I think you tried to call the program last week as well, but I think there was a, an issue. But I'm really happy that you've come through. And uh, also, I'm really glad that ultimately uh, we can have a chance to get your viewpoint. Now, you do a lot of counselling. That's some of the things that you do. Tell us about your view. Um, justice and hope are the two topics that we're talking about in the context of 84 and we've got youth here today to tell us how they feel and how they can pursue those goals. Sure, um, Savi Sabo, I think this is a great program. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I'm sorry I've, I've joined, the, joined the show pretty late, I've just finished my work, so I've just come on. Um, and I, I, I wish I had heard, you know, some of the views earlier. I think what I want to, what I want to talk about is uh, it, this. This issue is a very sensitive issue, you know. And I think that um, our culture and our religion, you know, Sikhism, you know, it, it has all, you know, all the components and attributes to really, really be able to handle something like a genocide. You know, we've, we've got it all. Like, for us, you know, we, we need to realize that conflict is actually very valuable. So the worst thing we could do is try and, try and uh, eliminate and erase the conflict that happened. But the other thing is that what has happened to us is a massive breakdown. Massive breakdown. And if we don't recognize that ev at the end of every breakdown, there's always a, break there's always a breakthrough. To succumb us there, it is. there is an incredible opportunity for a breakthrough. You have to recognize that here. You have to keep karma is breakdown the now, and then and then take take direction from the Guru Granth Sahib. Ji. And the Guru Granth Sahib, so no any body can send it. Just so that just so that every breakdown on there, so the body have to keep karma with all the you know social networking tools that we've got. What can we do about it? Yeah, and that was my point just now, just before you called, I was saying, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got online petitions, uh, we've got all this, um, I guess, virtual ammunition that we can throw out. So if somebody is going to Australia and, uh, you know, they actively have taken part and they've done something wrong, then everyone needs to know about it. And if the, um, the, the, I guess, the energy of not only the youth, but people that remember that this is such a terrible thing can get behind it, and when they get an email to actually just click on and respond to the petition and just sign it and say, look, we feel strongly that this thing should not be forgotten about and we need to keep the pressure on, you know? 
So yes, social tools are good. Um, and I, I know we spoke during the week as well, actually. We, we had a chat about some uh, other things that we were, some other projects we were involved in. Um, there is, I don't think there's ever a position of closure or completeness for this because it has affected us so badly, hasn't it? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think that uh, the people that have been hurt from this, you know, one of us is closure, completion, me, after the budget, etc., until they haven't, their story hasn't been heard. You know, it's, it's almost a case of asking them, you know, what would you, what would you, what do you need, uh, you know, as a result of having gone through this horrible suffering? You know, and that question isn't being asked because the, the you know, the, who we're being victims, you know, of this atrocity. You know, and what we've got to do is come out, out of the framework of being victims. And I think what we've got to do is step into, you know, being called in the matter. Because I do not eat your way out of and up here to the job. How can we transcend it? How can we step into a new paradigm shift for Gutsik? all around the world, you know. Uh, and I, I think that we've got to bring in like new new tools and take take direction from the Guru Granth Sahib. You know, in the Guru Granth Sahib, it's it saying Sarita, Bure Na Talakar, Gusa Man Na Handai, Dehi Rog Na Lagai, Palle Sab Kishpai, you know. So, Jere Rog Sab Lagneya, as a result of, you know, you know, being, being, being murdered or raped, that family being burnt alive, you know, or, or that you psychological look at you know, it's going to take a lot to get closure and completion for that, you know. And we, what we can do is stand in, you know, our feet, both feet on the ground and come back from, you know, uh, right? I mean, we, if we just become the victims and they are the tyrants you know, that have done these things to us, I don't think there's any possibility that we're ever going to see you know, any closure or completion. Okay, yeah, but, I, I appreciate that. And I think also the other thing is uh, it's important to realize that um, is the unity aspect, you know? Um, and I just, uh, you were saying earlier on about, you know, there's loads of channels and sometimes they don't, uh, they talk about certain issues and whatever, whatever. Um, you know, on these issues, which are pure core issues to our heart, we need to stand together for that. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody in their right minds, if they're good people, will actually stand for this nonsense. You know, the fact that you know people get away with it. You know, they they shouldn't get away with it. And I think you know, one of the things that I think prevails in this whole aspect of this discussion about 84 is to move it past the discussion and move it into action, right? And even when we had the D-Day situation, and I think uh, Capri and I uh, were on the stage together, and we said, look, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. You can write to your MP. Now, you, know, brother, you mentioned when you were at the 1984 mm -hmm. uh, uh, demonstration, march, right? and there's a whole lot of stuff that happens, and people talk about, uh, yeah. they do speeches and things, you know? And for the general, and I think it's something positive for some of you. Yeah, yeah, I'm really yeah, it's good, because thing those people are walking past mm. can see that this is a genocide situation mm. that we're still hoping will actually get uh, some kind of justice mm. uh, so uh, in the jeeps, um, it, was a, it was a really nice for you to call thanks so much for your um, your call and I look forward to hearing from you again and uh, thanks for taking part in the program uh, we'll see if there's another call coming through something on by group I read, um, I read this really interesting quote today um, that said, um, the definition of a slave is someone who wait, who is waiting for someone to free them. I think that's that's where we have become we've become in that situation today. I mean, we are we're a sovereign nation. You know, we were given our freedom, our azadi by our gurus. You know, and we were given our identity by our gurus, um, and yet we're constantly asking, you know, for governments or for people petitioning to, you know, British government and this that the other, you know, to help us. And yes, we do need political support. But we need political support on our terms, on the terms of the Sikhs, not on the terms of the oppressors. Right. You know, far too much has happened for us, you know, to negotiate with these people on on the way they they, they don't want to negotiate. With us. They want to com compromise us. Maybe there's a parallel strategy that you keep the pressure on socially, but you also do other things as well. I think we make one thing clear as well. Like, I mean, people talk about closure, and I think for some people, people may think that it's been just been 27 years, and you're going to still go on about the same old thing. I think with any wound, any historical event uh, as, as, as horrible and catastrophic as this, 
I think the first stage is recognition and yeah. acceptance. Mm. And the thing is, for the victims, and I've, the Sikh fund is a victim. You know, it's not just people who are wounded physically mm. and physically. It's, it's, the the whole it's all of us. You yeah. know, because there are mothers and our fathers, our brothers and sisters. But until people, on, on, until, until those who were guilty accept, until the world accepts, mm. until our own community accepts what happened, that's one of the things for I what it is, uh, that will that will be a walk. That's one of the things I had to remind us last night when I was actually thinking about all the different things that we could talk about today was, would there ever be a time where a politician who's guilty would suddenly wake up and go, you know what, I, I did wrong and I should really come clean about it. Are they so kind of the show that they that happened with yeah. Romero, who was yeah. one of the police officers who right. you know who who led, led the black cats, which were basically right. criminals released from prison, uh, murderers and rapists who were encouraged to dress up as Sikhs and commit atrocities and make you right. know, the freedom fighters mm -hmm. right. And he and he wrote a book. So these things will happen, you know. Let's think of it as well. I mean, for, for the the widows and something. How do you think they feel? People talk about closure. How do you feel when the same people who did those things to your family? Come into your neighborhood to can come and have your own votes and stuff. Yes, yeah, we've got another call coming through, so let's take that and switch that online. Why you pass out? Why you something? Let's switch the call through and see if we can get it. Can you hear us okay? Switching through? No, that call's gone. But when it comes again, we'll um, we'll definitely uh, connect. Why could you come okay. Why could you? Oh, why you have? Why you pass out? Why you pass out? Thanks so much for tuning in and also uh, contributing to the program. What's your view on uh, what we're talking about today? I, I, I really strongly believe that we've been, what happened happened in 84 and what have you, but we've been let down more so by our so-called leaders in this country. Right. If you go, I've been to all these marches and rallies and what have you, same old people, same old dialogue, and if anybody's young and, you know, someone who can make a change, can make a difference, they have to struggle to even have two minutes on the stage. Tell me about it. I was, uh, and, I was actually yeah, in that situation I know, a couple I, of weeks I, ago. I heard you on the disaster. <laughs> Thank you. But it, it's such a battle. And there are people dying in India now, mothers of the Shaheeds, and money has been collected on their name. But those poor women who lost their sons in the struggle, mm. they never saw a penny of it. Right. So now, you know, there is a whole generation out there that don't even know what happened in 84. And I strongly put that blame with our leaders that were going around on Sunday collecting money and all these good bloody. I won't hesitate to say, I would like to know where that money's gone. Okay. Because the people that needed it in Punjab, they didn't see a penny of it. Mm. They were not even aware that money was being collected on their name. Right. That's one issue. The second issue is until these leaders step back and recognize that they are not, you know, with all due respect, they don't have the capability in this day and age to be effective and let people like the guys that you've got on the panel there, let them take the lead and be active. You know, these guys need to be on Facebook. They need to be networking with people. And as I say, our so-called leaders, they've got the same dialogue that they pull out once or twice a year. We're not getting anywhere. Do, do you think there's an opportunity for almost like um, a, a kind of a convention uh, and the convention brings all the youth together and we record it and we stick it out there and we invite, you know, and, we, and, that can, and like, I think in Canada they have this thing called When Lions Roar. Uh, where they do get performers, but they do... Sorry, Tabby, I really can't hear you. The I can't hear what you're asking me. Okay, no problem. I think maybe we need to switch that. So can you hear me, can you hear me now? No, that's it. I would encourage everybody to get okay. out, tell their friends and family. As mm -hmm. I say, there is a huge generation out there that simply don't know the first thing. If you say 84, they'll look at you like, why, what happened in 84? What's so that? I would encourage everybody to tell their friends and family and educate everyone and let people know what happened. It's a huge human rights issue, huge. Absolutely. Yeah, well, thanks so much for the call, and we do appreciate all your contributions, and it's very valid, you know, that we really need to um, move forward on this with actual action from more of the youth as well, and maybe some of the other yeah. people need to step aside a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, let us have a chance to uh, talk the true story that still exists, you know? Uh, we're going to take another call coming through as well. What do you call that? What do you call that? What do you call that? Okay, right, we haven't got that call. So let's uh, move back. Let's move back to the conversation as well.
uh, while that call comes through again, and we will actually continue. Mm. What do you think of uh, Benji's uh, point? It's definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But if they're not going to let you at all, they're not going to make any make any films. I think We've got no money to make any of this media. I don't think it's about that. Standing though, on the street corner, just saying, "Hey, we have got an issue here." No, I think I think there's actually two issues. You know, we took you, five years. They've talked about more the kind of justice movement and things like getting justice at the high level. So you're talking about going to the government, petitioning people, making sure we get this. I think, to be honest, a lot of the youth, if you talk to them about that, and because they don't even know about it in the high level, they kind of think, well, 1984 has happened. We don't know what goes behind it. There's two issues. There's right, there's that movement, and that's maybe for the more, you know, Barilla Kibir out there, the one who study law, you know, in position of power, members of parliament, right. or someone that has kind of ambition to do that, to go, go that path. Then there's also those that can kind of just look at themselves and think, right, well, what can I do? And it's just going back to the work that I did with Carl Said, it's thinking, we talk about this poverty here and now, there's, you know, there's surely stuff that people can do, whether that be fundraising, I mean, spreading the word. It's not just the Shavid. people that you can trust, that are trust. Do good and things with the money. I'm, I'm going to say, I'm, you know, Banji was saying on the phone, that obviously they've collected money for, the, for all these good, all these good collected money, but it hasn't, a penny hasn't seen, you know, the families haven't seen a penny of it. I personally went there, money out of my own wallet, you had, your money. had my own money, gave it and put it into their hands. I mean, it doesn't get any, work. you can't get any closer than that. I know where the money's going. That's the good thing about when it comes to the media, the internet and all the technology we've got. I think one thing that is helping is that we can bypass mm. these views. Yeah. Know, you could find out about these things, initiatives and stuff. And and in terms of the youth, I think what they can do, one is educate themselves mm. and educate ourselves as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think it's definitely good point, definitely. Stuff. But secondly, what are you doing and stuff, you know, I'm totally grateful for it. Right. Because not, it's not just the monetary value. Mm-hmm. Him going out there, you know, to a mother to, you know, who's lost her son, to see another son from the bank to come to her. I know, that's nice. Yeah, because there's a connection, isn't there? Yeah. Let's take another call, because I think there's one on hold at the moment, and cut that through. No? So, yeah, I mean, there's a very good point. There is actually a line of verbal, so uh, we strongly recommend you do that if you want to take part in the programme. We've got about five to ten minutes left, so it's still mm-hmm. time for you to call through and give us your opinion about what you think we can do. Uh, what is there in terms of the power that the youth have today to move it on? The point that was made earlier on was the fact that get some of the other people to stand aside, they haven't had the chance to do too much. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they have done things, but we can't see it, and they don't communicate it. There could be that point of view as well. Mm-hmm. Um, on the issue of sovereignty, you know, Every Sikh is sovereign. We don't need leadership. You know, we we're born leaders. So, you know, if we can do gap years and end up in Costa Rica or some place like that, are you trying to tell me that a Sikh there out there, a Sikh girl or a Sikh guy, I can't take the initiative to try and go into places like Punjab? You know, it's not a foreign land. No, it's not. Well, they, they can speak the language. Yeah, they can't they, they, can't, can't they yeah. network with their organisations or work in Delhi to go and meet the widows and stuff? Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, I think the more that people go there and meet them, if you go to Delhi, go by. Uh, mm. It's uh, not hard. Spend some time, go to uh, the Willow Colony. Yeah, and, and check it out. And then also watch films like uh, The Willow Colony, which you can get. And, you know, there's some, an incredible film made uh, with direct interviews, and you can actually see. Uh, where those places are, the, what the mm-hmm. suffering is right now. Um, this film's only about, uh, I think, a couple of years old, uh, old and it, it's a dramatic film, mm-hmm. dramatic film that hits you in the heart about today's issues. I think we've got a call at the moment, someone's holding. Bye, you Okay, we've got another call. Like you were saying before earlier, uh, the hidden poverty and, you know, um, I don't really think it's hidden, like, you know, I think the violations that happened were so blatant, you know, I mean, some of them were ridiculously blatant, some of the stuff that happened, you know, it's just in your face, like, we don't care who you are, and we don't care about you, we're, we're going to kill your whole family, you okay. know, and it, it's, it's all out there, the history's out there, excellent books have been written, people like um, Sadlar H. S. Fulkar spent his whole life researching this, you know, there's there's been a lot of work done already. You know, there's a, there are good organisations doing, continuing to do work, but we're the ones that are hiding from the truth. We're the ones that have got our eyes closed. And you know, the, I'm, I'm personally, I, I don't really believe in the power of social networking and media because it's never been used for what it was invented for. Right. You know, now it's just become a tool of complacency. Really, you go on and go online and vent your frustrations and sit at home, and right. you know, and you go back into your bubble. Yeah, we really need to get out there ourselves. You know, feet on the ground, go out there, look at what's happened, look at these villages, people wear the t-shirts, find out the villages that these people were from, where their families are living in abject poverty. I think one of your callers from CK was talking about it as well, that to hear their stories. I'll never forget um, Ravinder Singh was telling about a story once, he called me quite late and said he just had a phone call from a Dagi Fodji. And 
he used to work with Ravinder Singh and said, you know, I was a fan of Fawzi too. And Ravinder Singh said, you know, okay, so where are you from and how can we contact you? And he goes, no, he goes, do not ask me any questions. He goes, I'm not, you're not going to ask any questions, you're just going to listen. And he goes, fine. And he goes, he told me this story about how, you know, how he's picked up and stuff and he's put in jail and how he's, how they tortured this teenager in the cell next to him all night and they could hear him screaming. And he goes, and he, it's a very, very long, sad story. And um, Ravinder Singh said, you know, I'm going to say it's life easy, but you know, he said that I, I've never broken down as like how I did that day. And the guy just said, that's what I want, I just want to, I've lived all my life not being able to tell it anyone. So there's that. so many stories that people don't know about. I think mm. there's a really, I don't know if you had a chance to read this book by uh, Simran Jit Kaur called Saffron Salvation, right? It's an incredible book. And it's written, in, uh, it's a story, it's a novel, it's based on true facts, and it's based on two brothers, one lives in Punjab and one lives in Delhi. And uh, this girl goes over from the UK and she gets to know them as friends. I think it's kind of a connection there. And then, um, and then when she comes back during that period of 84, one of them loses his life uh, in Punjab because he's tortured. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, brother is actually caught up in a Delhi uh, pogroms uh, and he loses his life as well and the book is very emotional and I'm not sure if it's actually available anymore but if you ever get a chance to try and look it up uh, and I would love to meet Simran Jet Gore as well who wrote that book because the passion behind it the emotion that it sets up the scene uh, of 1984 is just a true uh, depiction of what was actually going mm -hmm. on in that period and you know maybe that's you know another thing that uh, you can do as well that we can write books we can uh, create films we can use when you say the internet's not that good but at least it proliferates the the message out there at least it pushes out it has the potential it has, potential. it has the potential definitely i mean i, I do agree that you should back get on the ground put your feet on the ground i agree with it you. has it definitely has potential but it's not used in in the way yet that it's meant to be used for right. the social networking tools aren't used for grassroots movements and, and they're, they're, for fun, yeah. Yeah, they're there for fun they're mm -hmm. there for you know checking out people's profiles and you know what's the little person doing over here mm -hmm. it's, it's all rubbish really at the moment they're, they're such powerful powerful tools and marketing has cheapened everything you know that's what it comes down to marketing and consumerism and commercialism has cheapened the value of human life let alone you know what an internet based tool can do right. you know it's, it's deep we need to get out there. Don't forget with the anniversary of the of, of the genocide in Delhi, I think it's the soul searching time as well. Mm -hmm. I think some of you might have seen that video and that's being shown us on the news about the, the, the girl in China. Mm. And she was run over twice. Yeah. And then eighteen by uh, eighteen passerby walked past her and while she was just bleeding alive and stuff. And then she finally died. And it's just one of those things that people are saying that what, what's going on? Why are we why are people so not wanting to get involved? Mm. That's, that's it's, the issue. It's, the, it's the whole commercialism, the consumerism. It's just we're more interested in what the clothes we're wearing and the cars we're driving and how we're living to rather to care than about other people and what they've gone through. It's boring. That's mm. the reality of it. Mm. It's become boring now. And it's become why are you you know talking about the same stuff again and again? It, you know. I think it's excuse. Well, people say that oh, like um, that we should forget these things and move on. I think it's an excuse to I not do anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's excuse not to do anything. Complacent. Yeah. But you, I mean, you talk about the ripple effect, and sometimes within a community or a group of friends, it takes one person to make an action, Definitely. and people will see what he's doing. And you know, it's not like oh, I've seen them guys on TV. Do. It's like oh, my mate's doing that, and he's actually making a difference. Especially going out there, it's not hard. I know him. I've grown up with him. Yeah, you know. So that's. I mean, I just. I mean, I, I, I was on Carlos Adia on the Facebook page, and you know, they had. Oh, I went there. I put as my picture, or whatever, and I had like you know those people look at it, and obviously, even if one person comes away from that. I think oh, I'm just going to click on the website, have a look. He's then going to go through the same thing I went through a year ago, going up, setting up the direct debit, and then maybe running into it, maybe doing some sale around the future. Yeah. So fair enough, like you know, social media is there, and you know maybe it's not being used, but it's up to the people to use it. Yeah, I think that's the key thing. But it's also useful to have the content there to actually have that more available for people to actually look at. Well, mm. you know what? It's like wow, well, the whole hour has gone by, and yeah. we've been talking about this. Um, we really uh, the hour has gone by, and yeah. we've been talking about this. Um, we really uh, uh, appreciate your time to come on the show to talk about this. Okay. It's a sensitive issue from a number of perspectives. It's sensitive because you mention it and people go, oh, well, you know, talk about it before again. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, we're going to talk about it. And we'll talk about it even when, mm -hmm. and I hope, when, not if, when somebody apologizes for it and actually tries to put some action in place mm -hmm. to try and manage uh, the situation and the people that are suffering. 
But but take action about it as well. I think that's the key thing. Yeah. Don't just talk about it. Absolutely. Take action. What happens every single day for those people yeah. who are still yeah. Yeah. suffering. That's that's very good point. India still got the death penalty. They should hang some of these people. Yeah. You know that were responsible. Well, for we have the evidence. We have the information. Mm. We have. And if you go out there to look for it and put it in front of the people, mm. why can it not be? We need to, Everyone needs to really read about just once in cholera. Mm. What he went through. He, as an investigative person, tried to look up the atrocities. And the government said to him, the police said to him that we're going to kill you if you don't stop. And they did. In the conference, it was it they killed him. Record, I think they said, Jitte ne sare hajar, jitna ko aaj gaya, tenu lagta hai ek is one day make a difference. Yeah. And the threat to him that you really think if you yeah. and that's what happened. He didn't stop, and he was picked up and never. The thing is, they can they can target that. That's always they they're the terrorists because they what they want to do is terrorize the greater population of the Sikhs mm-hmm. into inaction. They want to brutalize us so badly by torturing a family and you know torturing a female and a male in such a horrific way that they want other you know 50 other people to turn their backs and say you know we don't want none of that. Well, you know what? They that we are terrorists and we got to stand up for our rights and our you know and really you know really got to do something and change change the reality for the people that are living 84 like five five you said every day mm. you know it's not going to change with that words. reminds me of a, i think i mentioned this before about probably one of the most famous speeches in history is uh the one that muhammad ali the famous boxer did when he went to oxford and he said uh, two words me we right so although it affects me in the context i'm a seek we in the context that we need to you know, do something about it together. And mm-hmm. it's not up to the youth necessarily, although they keep that issue alive. Uh, it's also up to the people that were there at the time to keep talking about it, to keep using the social networks, to keep signing the petitions, to keep going on the marches, to keep putting the pressure on in terms of talking about the fact that we're not going to forget about it. And we're not going to forget about it because just, justice in any society is important. You know, one of the things that I'm really kind of refreshed with is the fact that, you know, these guys were not even born then. They've done and spent time, you know, researching, trying to understand the issue, trying to really see what they can do. We have in the park who's actually gone there and actually visited families. We've had these guys here, you know, Shem uh, Sher Singh, and we've also had Bolteet Singh. They've researched, they've actually done some charity projects as well. So they've done something. They've gone out of their way. They've tried to get mm-hmm. some money together, go over there, give it to people, and put it into their hands so that it can make a difference in their lives. And you know, ultimately, I think all of that 84 situation will always affect our lives. And we really need to get uh, that hope that there will be justice and hope that ultimately uh, we as a society wake up to some of the points that you made. It is not about materialism. It's not about, you know, the fastest car that you drive or the flashiest, you know, tie that you wear or whatever. It is about uh, the importance of living together as a society and fighting for freedom, fighting for injustice. Uh, Because as Sikhs, we do that. As Sikhs, we are people that fight for the defenseless. And we've continued to do that. And right now, the issue is the fact that that attack is on us and it continues to be on us. And what we need to do is to raise the issue bring it home and take it back to those people so that they guilt themselves into coming clean on it, but also the hope for the next generation, the hope that we will all work together and be one people, right? be united around this issue. Mm-hmm. That's the key, to be united, to fight for freedom, to continue to fight for justice in a hope that we will get all of that at the end of the day. Bye, Gajika Kaka. Bye, Gajika Kaka.